All right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the to the press conference. Um, I can see that there's uh, lots of people here from uh, Guardian and the Times and the Mail and Didi Smog. So welcome, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm just gonna uh, give you a, a little list of names of the people that we've got on our panel today, and then we'll um, we'll jump straight into um, a, a brief intro from. Uh, Tim, and then we'll just open straight away for all of your questions. So we're joined today by uh, Days, who's a, a young climate activist who's been working in XR and beyond for some time. Just a point of information about Days, she's listed as um, XR youth on some of our um, descriptions for the event, but she would like to be just quoted as XR. She's not working with XR youth right now. That's just a technical point for you. Uh, we've got John Lines, who's a veteran campaigner, one of our oldest RSDs and very uh, loved by people um, who've watched him in action. Um, we've got Paul Stevens, a former police officer who you've probably seen in the media. He's been working with us for a long time, supporting us on Police Liaison. We've got Tim Crossland from Plan B. He's a former government barrister who's recently been seen uh, in the Supreme Court for contempt as an act of civil disobedience. We have Esther Stanford Jose, who's a Pan Africanist uh, reparations campaigner, and she's here from Extinction Rebellion's Internationalist Solidarity Network. Uh, Charlie Gardner, who's a senior conservation scientist and a member of XR Scientists. Marvina Newton, who's joining us from United for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter Leeds, who you may have seen out with us a lot on the streets recently. La Pethic, who's an elder, also an arrestee and uh, coming from our grandparents and elders circle. And uh, last but by no means least, Annika Sutcliffe, who's uh, one of the relationships coordinators in XR UK. Um, so I'll pass over to you, Tim, if that's OK, and you can just uh, set the scene for us. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the launch of the Impossible Rebellion. And impossible because it's impossible to believe that we could knowingly invest in the destruction of the conditions that make our planet habitable and do nothing about it, that we could stand by and watch our children betrayed, our country betrayed, the international community betrayed, and know that's happening, see that unfolding before our eyes and stand back passively. And that is impossible. And so from um, the 23rd of August, we begin the next phase of the rebellion. Um, we're not gonna go into details of precisely what's gonna be happening, but two key parts of it, holding crisis talks, the crisis talks that our government should be holding, but it's not happening. We'll invite people from across the community, across the country to come talk together about what is happening now, what we're going to do about it and how we come together in this moment. And we'll be targeting the city of London. And we'll be targeting the city of London because it's time that people understand the real contribution of, of the UK to this crisis. I think what we're seeing is more and more the age of denialism uh, propagated by vested interests is, is over. We're seeing the crisis now, the, the shift, the government propaganda is to try and tell us that the UK is leading the way. The UK is a climate leader. It's everybody else who is the problem. We ask you as members of the press to see through that. It's just not true. It's propaganda. What is true is UK's pr production emissions have been coming down because we've transitioned from um, an industrialized economy because we've exhausted all our own uh, non-renewable natural resources and exploited those of countries around the world for, for centuries. We're now a service economy. And the heart of that service economy is the financial economy, the city of London. And the city of London is the arch financier of the carbon economy. It supports 15% of global carbon emissions around the world. It hosts BP, Shell, Glencore, Anglo-American, and Russian oil and gas companies such as Gazprom and Rosnest. The world's largest energy company, Saudi Aramco, raised $12 billion via the UK debt markets. 
And a lot of this is distributed to UK shareholders. A lot of the activity that takes place, not in the UK, but around the world, destroying communities, devastating communities in Nigeria and elsewhere. That is all happening through the UK. That is what climate leadership looks like. And Aviva, what, the insurance giant whose job it is to look to the future, has told us that the FTSE 100 index sits within our jurisdiction. It's driving us towards four degrees warming. It's not us saying that, that is Aviva insurance. That is devastating, beyond words, unimaginable. And we're allowing that to happen. So that is why we go into rebellion next week. It's happening now. It's no longer happening over there. It's no longer happening in the places we've been exploiting. We've been turning into sacrifice zones. Those sacrifice zones are coming here. We've seen this summer, the heat dome around Canada and Northwest America, rows and rows of people prostrate in cooling centers, seen whole villages devastated in Germany, Luxembourg. We've seen um, um, infernos around the Mediterranean. And before we, we carry on, um, may I invite us all please just to take a minute to reflect on that, what it means for the people involved in that, the people who've been lost and their families and knowing that we're heading for much, much worse. So thank you, thank you for that. And um, um, we'd like to open it up now to, to questions. Thank you, Tim. Um, okay, so um, everybody who's attending whilst you're forming your questions and um, dropping them into the chat box, um, I thought I'd just open with, um, with a question to um, La, actually. Um, just to ask um, a, a broad piece from the perspective of the grandparents and elders um, uh, in XR, um, you know how uh, how does it how does it feel to be part of uh, of the ongoing work in, in the rebellion and and maybe you could just say why why you think grandparents and elders are so important in the movement? Yes, hi Clay. Yes, I will. Um, I think that the grandparents and elders bear a particular responsibility because it was our generation that sort of plundered the precious resources of our planet without thought of the future. So I joined XR because I can then be with the people who protest peacefully to hold this government to account for what I think is their criminal lack of action to mitigate our global warming and ecological breakdown. Because as an 85 year old grandmother, I believe I have a biological imperative to protect my children, grandchildren and all future generations. And lastly, I joined XR because I think it's the right thing to do. Thank you, La, and thanks for all your work. Um, Okay, so the questions are coming in. So I'm going to bring some of them from uh, the journalists who are here. Um, one of the questions from um, the Guardian: Will you be targeting particular companies in the city? I guess um, I might throw that out to you, Annika. Do you know? Hi, thanks, Claire. Um, <clears throat> sorry, a bit choked by that intro from from Tim and the just the severity of the the, the situation we're in right now. Um, so we will be focusing a lot on the city of London, that particular square mile, um, because if that square mile uh, was sort of put on par with other countries in the world, it would be ranked as the ninth biggest carbon emitter. That's just how much investment um, and regulation, how much power it has in terms of investing in fossil fuels. So we're going there with the immediate demand of um, immediately ending any new fossil fuel investment. 
Um, as you can imagine, there's there's a lot of investors, a lot of companies, sort of, um, you know, in that square mile. The the obvious ones, uh, the Bank of England, um, have huge power over regulating all the other banks in the country. Uh, we'll be launching local actions as well on Barclays. Um, these will take uh, take the form of digital rebellion as well. Um, so people that are stuck at home with COVID, uh, like me right now, <laughs> will be able to take part um, online as well. Um, I'm not going to name them all. There's there's lots you can use your imagination, um, but there will be marches and sort of site occupations as well in the city of London, and we'll be sort of touring that area and really doing our best to explain and make quite clear to our rebels and the public um, the the history of guilt, the the colonialism as well, the neo-colonialism that's going on um, that that these institutions are guilty of. Great, thank you, Annika. Um, Okay, so next question. We we need support from all the press to generate uh, the public support for the depth of radical change required to meet code red warning from the IPCC recently. Um, uh, how can we best uh, generate this support among the press and the public? Perhaps um, I'd like to go to you, Days, um, on this. Well, I always say climate change is actually something that's quite easy to get your head around because just being humans, we want to live, we want to breathe, we want to be able to have a world which we can flourish within. And when that's at stake, that means we need to do something. Um, so I do think that the press does need to just tell the truth and be honest with the fact that we're facing a very scary reality and there is something we can do. There is something we can do with protesting, asking, not even asking, demanding. Our government does um, put the actions in place that we need to have a sustainable world. Um, and I think that's very important. And I think the press should very much take ownership that they are responsible as well within this, not just as um, the people who tell what's happening, whether it's on the streets at our protests, um, but also so people who tell the truth and acknowledge uh, that they are a point of sharing information and this is the information that the general public needs to be able to make informed decisions around how to act when our government does nothing about climate change. Thank you, Days. Um, and then there's a, there's a question here um, just asking about uh, what we feel as a movement about COP and the UK's leadership role um, in the conference. Do we support the conference? Do we support the negotiations? Um, I've personally been working quite a lot on thoughts around, around this. And um, I know we've got a very broad movement, so there are many, many opinions, um, but I think there is relatively broad agreement that the COP process is not fit for purpose. It's failed humanity so far. Um, it looks like it's going to do so again because there's no significant difference. But I guess it might be one to ask, um, Tim, do you want to chime in a little on this as well? Yeah, I just remember this is COP26 because there have been 25 COPs before. That's a quarter of a century of COPs and lots of meetings in between. And the real revealing um, fact about that quarter of a century is that line that shows global carbon emissions going up even more since those talks began. And, and that is in part because the, the COP process privileges global economic growth over reducing carbon emissions. If you look at the history of the last couple of centuries and the astonishing you know, rise in global GDP, that has been powered by fossil fuels. That's just a fact. And unless you confront that, as the COP process is failing to do, that line is going to keep going up. Thank you, Tim. Um... Okay, this is a bit of a, a, a broader question. Uh, maybe you could put your hands up if any of you want to take it. It's, uh, it's from um, the Times, I think. Uh, could you spell out what you're saying needs to change in people's lives in the UK and by when? Um, I think this is a particularly difficult uh, question that we get asked because we're quite keen on um, participatory democracy and you know allowing people to decide which things change and how. Um, go for it, Marvina. I think it's very important that we put climate justice at the heart of everything we talk about. The most important thing that I could see is at the moment when it comes to the environmental um, activist, XR is leading on that. It's a heavy task that we've been put on. Even though I am not part of XR, I see so much value 
in what this conversation is because being Nigerian and from the diaspora with XR ISN, with XR Unified, with so many campaigns around really raising the awareness or global majority versus the government, it is time that we hold the, the corporate um, establishment um, accountable for what they're doing because if we don't, our children's future do not exist. And another thing we need to do is that it has to happen in a time frame in my lifetime. Our children deserve that. Yes, the task is impossible, but we need to be able to decolonize the space. We need to be able to tell the truth. And we want to ask the media. We want to free that press. We need the acknowledgement of exactly the climate crisis that we are in now. What's an emergency to some in the global south is an emergency right now. We are seeing rise in what we can see in Haiti at the moment. We can see things and more climate refugees coming in. We need to do something better to be able to hold everybody accountable. And it takes everybody doing their little bits to change it. We all are responsible and we all can do something different. And hopefully through this rebellion, you can see the movement of movement, the fact that sister groups, whether that's Black Lives Matter, whether that's Kill the Bill, whether that's United for Black Lives, whatever the movement is standing in solidarity with XR right now and saying we're up for the task and we are here to change um, the legacy of what the climate crisis is now and doing something, you need to be accountable in that process. Thanks, Marvina. Uh, go for it, Charlie. I'd just like to, que to um, question the framing of that question. What needs to change in people's lives? This question puts the onus on individuals, citizens of this country, to change their lives. That's not what we're asking. The, the power of individuals to bring about change is very limited. The powerful actors here are governments. Governments sets the rules of the game that corporations and citizens play by. Governments also um, are able to influence corporate behavior through taxes, through um, you know, financial incentives. We, um, the, I, I sort of reject the premise of this question about what the ordinary British citizens need to change in their lives. What, I personally am involved in this in this movement for is to um, to oblige to to force the government to change the rules of the game that the rest of us um, have to play. Super, thank you, Charlie. That's really helpful to question the framing of it. I think um, there's a question here that I think might be good for you, John. Um, which is uh, why rebel now when the country is going through a, a bit of a tough time already. And, um, you know, as such a long standing campaigner, you must um, have a huge amount of experience of taking things to the streets in all kinds of different uh, circumstances. So um, I don't know if you want to speak to, to that. Oh, you're on mute, John, just. <laughs> right now, um, in the run up to COP26, um, well, this is a critical moment, a critical opportunity for our government to do something. And what are they doing? They've cut down on international aid. They've increased the funding for the armed forces. They've dithered over the new coal mine in um, Cumbria and over the new oil fields. Um, it's really a disgrace. And this is what we ought to do now. And this is why now is the moment to do it. Thanks, John. And um, hearing you on the international aid and uh, maybe I could just bring you in Esther uh, to just speak about the UK's kind of position and responsibility in terms of the, you know, the global justice questions that are before us with climate, with climate crisis. Sure. Um, you know, from the perspective of those of us in XR Internationalist Solidarity Network, we feel that this phase of rebellion is very, very key to centering uh, the resistance struggles of those already in rebellion in the global south as a matter of their own very survival. And the role of Britain today, and in particular, 
this promulgation of Empire 2.0 and what this is unleashing in the global south um, in terms of eco fascist regimes that are also oppressing their own peoples by a system of neo-colonialism. And those of us in the UK have a responsibility to hold the governments and corporations to account, especially those operating in the city of London and registered on the London Stock Exchange for their um, furthering of ecocide and genocide in the global south. So what we're seeing with this rebellion, which I think is different, is that it's no longer this projection, which is what happens a lot in the mass media of, um, you know, the white person's burden to save the world. It is really about those of us uh, in the UK merging rebellion with those already in resistance to transform our world. And there's leadership, those in the global south who for centuries have shown the way in how to lead, live sustainably and actually protect ourselves and protect our earth that sustains all our lives. And I think it's important and very symbolic that this XR wave of the impossible rebellion commences actually on the 23rd of August, um, beginning with an opening ceremony on the Well, I think we've lost Esther there. Um, okay, I'm just gonna come back in, Esther, if you can hear me, maybe if you turn your camera off for a moment. Um, I think what she's trying to say is that we're, we're uh, conscious that we're launching the rebellion on a, on, a, on a day, which is the anniversary of the Haitian revolution and recognizing those people who've uh, gone before in movements for, um, freedom and, and, and human rights and in the name of life. Um, so I'm just going to bring in one question quickly uh, from the independent um, for you, Paul, um, and then um, come back to something that we've that we've covered, but I think that we need to talk about again. So um, independents say, uh, I was wondering how concerned XR is about the wider legal crackdowns on protest in the UK. Is it making it harder to attract people to the movement and or to the protests? And um, uh, Paul can speak to this uh, much further, but I have noticed on social media where we've had um, some of our uh, prosecutions overturned recently there have been some positive noises online of people saying well I was a bit nervous about getting nicked but actually um since as since as people are sort of admitting and even in the legal establishment that people have a right to undertake this type of work um maybe I will show up next time it feels positive so go for it Paul am I am I personally concerned yes definitely very concerned about um the PCSE bill and and what's coming in do I think it deters people? Um, I think some people might be put off, but overwhelmingly, I think they're not. I think most people that have read the science and realise the threat that we're facing have no choice. They realise that there are sections of our society that are actually delaying the mitigation of climate change for profit. And there's nothing you can do apart from get out on the streets and try and send a message that we're not going to tolerate that in a peaceful way. You know, it's the only thing we can do. So I think, you know, in a way it has the reverse effect. It doesn't put people off. It actually makes them, like my, my parents fought fascism in the war. My, sorry, my grandparents, I'm not that old, um, fought fascism in the war. And, 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 and when you sort of grow up with that, the kind of the, the spirit that I know from them is that when you get bullied, you don't put up with it. You, you stand up for yourself. And it takes a lot for the British people, I think, to do that. But once they get to that point, you are not going to put them off with, uh, with new legislation um, when you're looking at billions of deaths. So, I mean, we have to tell the truth and we have to demand that something is done about perpetuating a situation that is just increasing the risk. And I think what most people understand now from the PCSC, from the IPCC report is not only that it's a, a code red, that it's much more serious than we actually thought, um, but also that it's man-made. So our, our message for a long time was that our house was on fire or our planet was on fire. But now we know it's arson. And for me, an ex-copper, you know, that's quite interesting. Who is responsible for having created this situation? 
But as XR, we don't name and shame. What's more important is who is trying to perpetuate this disaster? Who is actually standing in the way of us tackling it? So I think most people are grasping that now and will come out on the streets and join us. Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul. I mean, we've been talking as well in the press team quite a lot about how, you know, the IPCC report in 2018 really laid the really laid the pathway for XR to come out for, you know, for Greta. There was also the Hothouse Earth paper that summer. There were lots and lots of pieces that serendipitously, to me anyway, like made the conditions for us to launch XR very good. And I think there's something of a moment around this IPCC report. I mean, I know it had all the headlines, big news night special and all of the rest of it. And it feels to me relatively disappointing that it's died down so quickly as a national news story when it, it, I don't think there could be a more important news story, uh, you know, that we're going to destroy civilization um, through an action on this. But um, I can see your hand up, Annika. Do you want to come in? Was that me, Claire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or did you not mean to have your hand up? Sorry, internet issues. I did. It just it was a very short point, just um, from the relationships building perspective in XR, what we've actually seen um, with the rise of the Kill the Bill coalition around this policing bill is actually it's, it's sort of created a common enemy. Um, you know, Pretty Patel's brought in this bill, which is no surprise in the sort of long game of XR having shown its power, Black Lives Matter rising, and what's now happening is a coming together of movements um, with a real reason to come together more than we had before. Um, so I, I, I doubt that's the effect she wanted, um, but that's what's happening. Um, and that starts uh, to kick off the rebellion on Saturday 21st, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Parliament Square is, is, is a, a huge sort of coalition coming together um, against the policing bill. Cool, thanks Annika. And also just to note um, uh, that we've had thousands of signups and um, in recent days and our uh, crowdfunder is doing extremely well so it does it feels from within the movement like we're uh you know um we should be preparing for uh, hopefully a very successful rebellion um esther i can see that you're back do you want to um complete your uh comments i think you were going to just speak about the anniversary uh and the date we're launching and everything I've been advised to turn off my camera because of the poor internet connection. So, uh, you know, I'm really, really pleased that XR has listened uh, to those of us who are from Global South communities uh, about the importance of projecting the reality of global resistance and action on climate change that is being led by communities of resistance who have long been actually um, sounding the warnings uh, about this code red for humanity. And by doing so, um, launching, I think very symbolically um, in terms of targeting the financial institutions, the city of London, recognizing the role of the city of London, uh, not only in um, you know, furthering the climate and ecological crisis and contributing to it, but the origins of it in actually the global separation of humanity in terms of the dispossession of indigenous peoples in their enslavement, as well as the enslavement of African and other colonized peoples, colonialism. This is actually the beginning of what we are now witnessing uh, in terms of the climate and ecological crisis. So it's coming full circle where um, I think the majority of humanity um, is, is actually very poised to support this rebellion because we are operating on different fronts and that is the importance of international solidarity that we are promoting. So I was talking about the um, anniversary, the 23rd being the anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, which was also declared as the United Nations International Day for remembrance of the so-called slave trade and its abolition to mark uh, the, the 
uh, commencement of the Haitian Revolution in 1791. And I think the example of Haiti today is one of those countries where the people have been in direct resistance for centuries, literally from when uh, the state of Haiti, um, the, the, the example of a successful rebellion of enslaved peoples to establish a modern state, uh, but they have been in rebellion since 1804. So they have been resisting all forms of the climate and ecological crisis, beginning with colonization and uh, being forced to actually pay for their independence. And I think there is a lesson there for all of us in terms of what the solutions are. You know, I, I mentioned earlier about the significance of indigenous peoples who, although only 5% of the global population in lands where they still live, um, actually, uh, you know, are preserving 80% of Earth's biodiversity. So beyond actually stopping the harms of extractivism and fossil fuel extraction is also about let us restore sovereignty. Let us be part of those struggles of those first peoples who have been saying, we know how to live in harmony with the earth. And this is really a wake up call for all of us to actually change, not just our lives, because I'm hearing the point about individual change and the role of governments, but part of what uh, you know, we learn from impossible rebellions of the past is that when people have come together across their differences and, and have actually put what is most important at the forefront, then we actually can move mountains. And that's the example that we're trying to also inculcate in people, that we're not powerless, that we have to bring about the alternative progression, the alternative forms of development that are not based on extractivism, you know, annihilating literally life on Mother Earth and also furthering war in order to benefit a few, that we have to bring about a new way of life. And where governments do not respect the will of the people, what we've also seen is those governments can topple. And so that for me is part of the inspiration of many of us who are part of Global South communities where we have done that. And that is really what we're saying to people in the Global North. Actually, you have more power than what you think. And so let us use our collective power to be the change that we want to see. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, I'm glad we got you back on the call to uh, close your close your remarks so powerfully. Um, Tim, do you want to come back on that as well? Yeah, just wanted to pick up on Esther's comments and contextualise them a bit in that COP process and that fault line we were talking about earlier on. The language of the COP process is it's all framed in terms of developed country parties and developing country parties. And we take that language for granted. I mean, we, we use that language without thinking about it. But what it actually means, developed country parties are the high consuming, high polluting, high destroying countries. Mm -hmm. Developing country parties, because of the relationship, that tight correlation between economic growth and carbon emissions, are the low consuming, low polluting countries. So that language already hardwires an aspiration that's going counter to the objectives of the COP process. We can't reduce emissions while the message to everybody is you must consume and pollute more. So that's what needs to be confronted. We cannot do both things at once. We've got to be realistic about this. Thanks so much, Tim. So that takes me back uh, to the question that I wanted to return to actually quite neatly. Um, uh, one of the attendees has said, thanks, but people haven't really answered my question. What things are you saying need to change in people's lives? And is there a reason why XR is not giving clear answers on the implications of what it's calling for? Does net zero by 2025 just mean something that's, you know, extremely, um, uh, would be extremely unpopular is, is the question. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I uh, spoke to some people recently about what a global kind of carbon budget per capita 
may look like. And of course, across Europe and um, America and a lot of rich countries, we have such a high carbon footprint per person. Um, and we and we can clearly see that there's a there's a there's a question here around consumption. So do you want to um, maybe further to that to that point, Tim? Um, yes, I mean, we, we've, we've got to be honest with people, first of all, haven't we? And I think it is absolutely true. Um, there are risks on both sides. There are risks of coming down to zero carbon by tomorrow because our economies depend on that. And we do need to be honest. And we do need to not mislead people by this talk of clean growth that implies it's just a matter of switching everything to, to wind and solar and we can just carry on. And this isn't us saying it, this isn't about political ideology, this is the IPCC saying the implications mean we're going to need whole scale transformation of our societies. This is Sir Patrick Vallance, the chief scientific advisor to the government who's written to the prime minister and said, not sure you understand the level of transformation. We've got to bring people with us. And what we've seen through the pandemic is when the public understands what needs to be done to protect their families, to protect the people that they love, they will do it. But of course, nobody's going to make massive sacrifices if they don't understand what's at stake, if they don't have good information. So this is the crucial thing, that people understand the risks, they understand the situation, and we get into crisis talks right now because it's happening now in front of our eyes. Thank you, Tim. And I guess like something to follow on from that, which I think is often absent from that question, you know, is this going to be unpopular? What does it mean for people's lives today? I would like to bring you back in days because um, as a younger person on the panel, it's very well for us to ask ourselves, what does this mean for people's lives in the next few years? And perhaps it looks politically challenging and like people might have to, you know, consume less in, in multiple different ways. But of course, you're probably looking at how this might affect my life in 10, 20 years time. As a young person, do you want to, do you want to bring that perspective? Yeah, I feel like young people are like fully recognised. We won't be able to live in the same ways that our parents and their parents did. Um, I think that's something that everyone everyone knows. Um, but also, I think within young people, there is this change in finding our ways um, to quantify what success is. Um, and maybe for my mum's generation, success was to buy a really big Jeep. Um, but for us, it's something totally different. It's spending time with our families. It's being able to enjoy nature. It's being able to go thrift shopping with our friends. Um, so I do think that when we ask this question about how difficult things are going to be, um, I think it's kind of like a way to demonise the fact that change can actually be really good. Um, and we can start looking at this change that's going to have to happen as something positive, as something that we can use to reimagine what our futures could be like and to aim for the impossible, um, to aim for a world in which we can learn how to take care of one another, learn how to base everything we do in love and duty to one another. Um, so I, I think um, let's not see this as everyone's going to have to start living life very differently and it's going to be awful, but let's see it as a way that we can change the way our world works now and lots of things that aren't working for many people can be resolved so all of us can get to a point of living a very good standard of life um, and prioritising things that we don't prioritise now. Thanks, love. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we when we look at the the kind of big and, and and serious conversations that are asking about what needs to change, you know, questioning whether we need to move to some form of a post-growth economy, for example, the, 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 the heart of that conversation is about values and about what we value. And so I guess um, in answer to the question of what needs to change in people's lives is that I think people's value systems need to change uh, so that we prioritise less acquisition and increasing our own personal uh, wealth or increasing our own personal consumption or chasing after status in, in the society. But actually, you know, what values do we really love and cherish? And that's what we've been trying to write into some of the some of the some of the comms for this rebellion and thinking through what we're what we're putting through the media team, which is which is where I work. So we can talk about the values that the ordinary people hold uh, the dearest, I think, are things like trust. Um, you know, we, we definitely have a, a crisis of trust 
in terms of the political management of, of, of this nation, I believe, at the moment, um, and particularly, you know, no, no trust in this government for their leadership in the G7 or at COP or, you know, on the biodiversity crisis. So um, I'll come to another question then. So uh, from D Smog, this is what's XR's specific demands for the government or companies in the protests that we're announcing today? So I don't know if anyone wants to uh, chuck their hand up and, and take this one, but obviously we've got this immediate demand to halt all new investment in fossil fuels. Um, that's been uh, brought as an immediate demand. Obviously, we've got our we've got our broader kind of demand set, which you all probably are familiar with. Um, but it feels appropriate um, to to have this immediate demand because um, I mean it's just the most obvious thing to do. Everybody's crying out for for decades that at some point we need to get off fossil fuels. And if you reach a moment where the IEA agree with us then I think it's fair to say it's not even a very radical demand it's just really obvious so I don't know if anybody wants to to come in on that having an immediate demand on on stopping fossil fuel investment I think you said it all Claire there <laughs> go for it Tim well, I mean, ju just to add that this isn't just Extinction Rebellion, you know, this is coming from and backed up by the International Energy Agency, um, which is an intergovernmental agency supported by the UK government, and it has said it must stop. We can't carry on investing in our own destruction. We've got far more fossil fuels already that we can burn. And this is a sort of Ponzi scheme that just brings down the price and makes it impossible for anything else to compete. So, yes, it's it's us um, articulating the demands that um, um, the International Energy Agency and many others have already made. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Uh, go for Annika. Um, well, it's not so much on this topic, but I'm noticing a lot of questions around a bit more on specifics of the plans for the next couple of weeks. I'm wondering if you want me to talk to that. Or are you going to come on to that anyway? Uh, yeah, you can move on to that if you like, Annika. I mean, it, a lot of it does relate to uh, the immediate demand as well, doesn't it? And mm. trying to frame, frame the rebellion in that context. So go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a couple of things in there that are just worth completely clarifying. I've seen come up, um, are we going to be targeting public transport? There's questions come up. Uh, not that I know of. Um, there's no plans to directly target public transport. Um, we do expect our protests to be disruptive. Um, it's, it's civil disobedience rather than protests. We do believe that that's the state we're, stage we're at and that's what's necessary. So they will be disruptive. Um, but we are focusing in on the city of London, where the where the power holders are, and and really, you know, making sure that that message is clear why we're targeting that area. Um, so, although some of the actions will be publicly engaging, trying to bring the public in, and they may be in public places, um, the core of the disruption will be in the city of London. Um, there was a question about how long they'll go on. Um, we're starting with the Kill the Bill march on Saturday um, with the sort of official rebellion launch on Monday morning, meeting at Trafalgar Square at 10 a.m. Um, we expect this, um, it to go on for a couple of weeks, could be longer. Um, a lot of rebels, you know, are very committed to this demand being met. So, so there's, there's a sort of rhetoric that we will, we will rebel until this demand is met. When we declared rebellion in 2018, it was um, being an open rebellion in an ongoing way. So when we come together for these intense periods in London, this is sort of when we really strategically want to all come together to the same place at the same time to try and create a real whirlwind of activity and focus around a particular message and bring rebels together from across the country. But we are in open rebellion consistently until our three overarching demands are met. Um, in terms of the what the protests will look like, um, some some of some parts of the protests will be similar to before, where we take some sort of site occupations. Um, there will be marches. Uh, we've got marches themed around particular things. I think it's worth saying as well that um, part of rebellion is joyous. It's a celebration. It's a coming together. Um, people need to come together and feel. Um, feel love and and hope and you know being with each other and recognizing other people recognize the state the world's in and, and can talk and share and um, so some of the the marches will have you know real celebratory atmosphere there'll be music there'll be dancing um, we've got a march themed around nature one theme around animal rights another one themed around celebrating global justice and history of resistance around the world um, what else to say 
I think that's what I want to say. I want to say there's, you know, there's a joyous element in all of this, um, but we do expect to be going on for two weeks. We are expecting thousands of people. Uh, there's a question about signups as well. I think we've had 2000 new signups just in the last couple of weeks. Um, so there is a sudden way, a fresh wave of new rebels joining us. I think we're expecting maybe 40% of the people on the streets with us will be brand new. Um, so given the IPCC report, the floods in London, the state, the stage we're at right now and COP coming up, we are expecting that we're going to have a huge influx of, of new people um, and invite you to join us. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Annika. Um, and uh, yeah, as I as I said in an interview the other day, like everybody's totally welcome. So, uh, you know, if you want to uh, leave your um leave your press card at home and, and come out with us. You're also welcome. Um, I'll uh, pass on to Paul quickly, just because I think you might have more, more to add maybe on the, the nuts and bolts of what's happening in the next few weeks. Oh, and, um, well, I mean, we've made it quite clear that we've uh, notified the police about what we're doing, that we've got a rebellion made up of separate um, actions. We're not telling them details, same as with um, with journalists, sorry about that. We're not telling details, basically because for the last 18 months, when we have given a lot of detail about what we're doing, then the police, unfortunately, the Metropolitan Police, my old firm, um, have given us less respect to protest than when we don't tell them what we're doing. And when we, when we liaise just with the lower um, ranks and with borough police, then they properly weigh up our right to protest against um, uh, disruption and, and when we're dealing with the more politically aligned senior ranks um, then the, the response is really any disruption is not tolerated. Um, so that's what we've experienced. So this time we're going to have, we, we do have communication with the police um, uh, for safety reasons, that's really important, the safety is paramount but we're not giving details of individual actions. Um, so that's that's where we stand now. Super, thank you, Paul. Um, okay, so I'm going to quickly move into another question because we're starting to run out of time. Um, how would you respond to the latest right-wing narrative in the UK that getting to net zero is too expensive for ordinary people to afford? Um, have seen this emerge from places like the Global Warming Policy Foundation in recent weeks. I mean, I think a lot of us who uh, watch the media um, closely and are, and are tuned into that think tank space are very well aware of... Uh, the, the narratives that, that get planted in order to um, dis destroy policy, poss possibility of certain policies for sure. Um, and obviously we've just seen the Exxon um, lobbyist exposed in, um, in, 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 in the most extraordinary way. Uh, it's very, very obvious um, to everybody now what's, what's been going on behind the scenes and what continues to go on. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to, to, to speak to this. I mean, I know that broadly a lot of people in our movement are talking at the moment about how uh, much you can't afford not to. It's actually easy to run that narrative that it's going to cost a fortune until you look at the cost of inaction, which is going to destroy the economy, right? So does anybody want to come in, come in further to that? Um, Charlie, go for it and then take Tim. Just to really build on what you said, Claire, so this is a recognised tactic. Um, you know, those that stand to profit from there not being um, you know, legislation to promote decarbonisation, they, they started off with the nihilism. They have moved on to what's known as predatory delay. Um, and, you know, there are a number of different um, tactics, a number of different framings a number of different reasons why society shouldn't engage in rapid and complete decarbonization. The motivation for these is to allow them a bit more time to carry on making massive profits. Yes, of course, um, decarbonization will cost money, but everything costs money. Edu schools cost money, hospitals cost money, food and housing costs money. None of these things are optional and neither is decarbonisation. Okay, go on, Tim. I, mean, I think the encouraging thing from our point of view is it's starting to look like the PR companies of the vested interests are running out of good lines because this one is, is surely it's just embarrassing to, to, to be implying it's too expensive to save our young people. 
people. It's too expensive to save our country. It's too expensive to save um, our planet. I mean, um, it, it just, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, and what it speaks to is this extremist ideology in some parts of the Conservative Party that actually believes that science will have to give way to the market, to the political economy. It's not going to work that way. It is the other way round. I mean, our political economy will have to adapt to the science. And I think there are some hard-headed realists in the Conservative Party who understand that very well. And there's a debate within the government at the moment on exactly this. We've got to confront the crisis that we face and put extreme ideology behind us. Cool. Thank you, Tim. Um, OK, so just to let you know, we've got loads of questions, so I'm going to uh, probably allow this to run over for about 10 minutes, if that's fine with everybody. Um, obviously, you know, people can can leave if they need to. Um, so another question here from uh, somebody from the BBC. Will there be other actions in locations across the UK um, other than the square mile? Um, and uh, yeah, there are some regional regional actions coming up. I don't know who can speak to that. Go for it, Annika. Uh, well, just very much in brief. So this concept of crisis talks, which is about inviting everybody to the table, trying to challenge this cultural divide, really allowing people some empathetic space to come and talk about what crisis means to them. That is a concept which we're launching across the whole UK and encouraging um, people to host these, these crisis talks anywhere, whether that is you know, in a park or in a shopping centre um, or in the road or outside their house. Um, so that might be something you see popping up all over the UK. Um, and then the, the sort of other part of us going to the city of London um, in, a, in a decentralized, localized way across the UK, I think we'll mainly be focused on, on local banks such as Barclays and HSBC and their, um, you know, their, their guilt in, in all of the, the whole thing. So th those are the local actions you can probably expect. I've seen today that there was um, a, an action on ExxonMobil, though, which also sort of hammers that point about the, the fossil fuel industry as well. So. Uh, a short answer as well as we don't know we're a decentralized movement <laughs> <laughs> thanks Annika yeah action um in Norfolk today isn't it against uh Exxon they've got a, a small blockade it looks good um okay so next up uh and maybe just chuck your hand up if you want to say anything about this so uh from the Guardian is economic growth necessarily incompatible with reducing emissions um is there such a thing as sustainable economic growth? I think it's really fascinating to watch this conversation sort of fly up the agenda recently where uh, it felt impossible to have this conversation in a national kind of, uh, in a public discourse kind of sense when we started XR for sure. Um, and now seeing it, seeing it all over the place, including in some departments of the EU um, and uh, and all over the BBC. So that's kind of interesting, right? But um, who wants to who wants to speak to um, growth and emissions? I've got a feeling that Tim, you might be a good candidate. Sure. Well, I, I can come in a little bit on that. I think it's it's just crucial on this that this is not an ideological conversation. I mean, economic growth has done wonderful things for many, many people. And so it's, it's not about hostility to that. It's about looking at the evidence. And that's precisely what Professor Das Gupta did, um, who commissioned by the Treasury, um, to produce a report on the economics of biodiversity. And we had that report earlier this year published by the Treasury. And it says, actually, you know, GDP is important as a measure, but we make it our goal. That locks in destruction because GDP, you, you have a rainforest, you keep the rainforest there, it does nothing for GDP. You cut it down, you turn it into firewood, you destroy all those communities that depend on it, that boosts GDP. So making that our dominant goal is locking in destruction. And you look at the, the, the evidence and that tie between carbon emissions and um, um, global growth, it's very difficult to believe we can cold turkey on carbon and keep growing. 
it feels like looking at that evidence that what we're going to have to try and do is come together to contract intelligently so that we don't have massive massive collapse that's our option and that we then have convergence with other economies who who have a right to keep developing in their own way so it's contraction and convergence as opposed to expansion and divergence massive inequality thank you tim i can see your hand up marvina I think it's so important for us to decolonize the economy. And um, one of the things I know that part of the action, Money Rebellion has done some of this work, but um, XR um, International Solidarity has done some great work around um, reparative justice. But I know on the 27th, there will be conversations around the Blood Money March and to look at all the corporate entity and the financial establishments who have really benefited from colonization and still did till now. We need to be able to have these honest um, conversations on who is funding fossil fuels, who are complicit in environmental racism, who have benefited off the backs of um, colonization that still our countries are still um, in the global south are still suffering. And I think what Tim and um, Esther has highlighted is that importance of holding the corporate um, economical beast accountable in a peaceful manner to be able to say, tell the truth. And also, what are you going to do? It's not about just having rebellion, but also seeing what is the forward plan on creating these changes. I think that's the most important thing for us is that we rebel because our life depends on it. We stand in solidarity because it's so important to call these economical beasts as they are, who just wants to churn in and not be held accountable for the actions that actually put our lives at risk. Thanks, Marvina. Um, I hope you're still with us, Esther. I just wanted to check if you uh, wanted to follow on with anything from there. I'm not sure if we've got Esther here. Um, it's interesting you use that word accountability, uh, Marvina, because I think for me recently thinking about um, the COP process, thinking about what's coming up um, in terms of rebellion and people saying, why are you still rebelling? And why do you think it matters to, to point the finger at the government or at the city of London or whatever? And, it, and it's a question for me of accountability when you look to the international space. Yeah, we've got an agreement that nobody's actually gonna meet. Um, there's no accountability. When you look at uh, Tim's uh, recent kind of um, visit to the Supreme Court, um, that was really um, a, an act of civil disobedience to say the government is writing policy which is not in line with the agreements that it's made at the international level. And so trying to hold accountability within your own country. Um, when you look at the companies that are continually investing in fossil fuels now, and we know that the infrastructure that exists takes us well beyond the 1.5 temperature limit that everyone's agreed to, and still money is being ploughed in, and there's no accountability there either. And so you look around for somewhere where you can find some. And um, as an individual, I personally have, have looked at that and thought, well, shit, there's nowhere. <laughs> there's nowhere to find these people to be held accountable. And um, sorry, folks, but also largely not um, enough in the media either. The media could hold these people accountable. And we really, really need you to help us to do that. Um, so... Um, yeah, I guess we've got a few minutes left. I said we'd run over by 10 minutes. So um, I don't know if any of you uh, panellists have got anything you'd like to express. It would be really nice maybe to hear from you, La or John, one of the uh, elders at the, at the end of the session. So I'll take um, a quick word from Marvina and La uh, and then uh, Annika. I think I'm just going to bring back um, the police and crime sentencing bill. We're protesting to protest. It, it, it's one of those things where I need to explain that it's non-violent. We are having this conversation on, if we do not want to protest, we just need an equitable society. What they didn't expect this bill to do, which Annika perfectly put together, and um, was that 
they didn't expect, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we're seeds that were going to come together. And movements of movement being built are crossed. They tried to put XR against BLM and that didn't really work. They said they created this bill to actually oppress our voices. Well, we protest and we rebel because we owe the world that responsibility. We want to be counted accountable for what we did to change society. And this bill is affecting a lot of the marginalized and disadvantaged voices who need to be able to speak out our woes on exactly how these organizations is happening now. We need to act now. Also on top of that, we need to understand that as the sea rise, we die in whatever we do. And it's so important to make sure when it comes to the police and crime sentencing bill and every other oppressive bill that comes from it, which we know that the immigration and the international operation bill that has come true, we need to be able to see how does that impact the environment? How do we make sure we can still tell the truth? And for the media here, we ask you, start telling the truth. Let's make sure we free the press and you can then put your own investigative journalism into play to tell exactly the truth of what's happening with this bill. Um, moving forward. It needs to go back on the limelight and hopefully we'll see you on the 21st. Thanks, Marvina. Um, let's hear from you, La. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. I think it is really important to recognize and accept that the changes in lifestyle are going to be difficult, really, really challenging. There's no denying it, but it's also, if we don't change those behaviors, far worse will come. And I want to remind people that I grew up in the Second World War, and that was a time when the will of people and parliament came together. And with those conditions, everything became so much easier. Also, we lived a very simple lifestyle. No cars, no planes, no television, and certainly no internet. We made our own entertainment, we grew our own food, we had a fantastic community spirit. We came together and it was great. We have never been healthier. And I'd like to remind everybody of that. And thank you. Thank you, La. Uh, and finally, go to you, Annika. Thanks so much, Claire. Well, an honor to have the last word. <laughs> um, and it, it builds on what La was just saying, actually, what I wanted to come back to, um, just to answer Ben Webster's questions more directly. I can see your frustration, Ben, I don't feel we have. Um, I think it's really about understanding XR's role in this kind of sphere of trying to make change and, you know, the whole environmental green justice movement, um, understanding our, our role, us understanding our role, you understanding our role. Um, we're not here to talk about the details of solutions. We're not here to be the experts on the science or policy. Um, you know, we're here to sound the alarm and we're here to try and shift the conversation as fast as possible because of the, the state of the emergency that we're in and that's why we call for mass civil disobedience because it's the only it's the only way to to, sh to shift you know the action necessary um as as fast as as it needs to be moved and you know in that respect we're not dictating how people's lives should change we're not dictating specific policy changes there are experts out there that we can point to um that i'm sure you're in touch with as journalists that you should be platforming it's not about us it's about the crisis that's out there and it's about coming together as a nation and globally to deal with this on the scale necessary. And that's why we take the actions um, that we take to shift this conversation as, as fast as possible. And we really hope that you'll play your part in it. Thank you. Thank you, Annika. Um, yeah, I guess it's also really important to recognize that people have for a very long time been campaigning for green jobs, for millions of green jobs, actually. There's a fuck ton of work to do, right? <laughs> it's not it's not gonna be hard to like find ways to to, to create a, a good working environment where people are, are doing the, the, the most obvious things. And I think, you know, there are some obvious steps that people can take first aside from, aside from rebellion around transport, around heating homes, around insulating homes. You know, there's, there's tons and tons of things that can happen that could immediately improve people's lives and create loads of employment and make Make everyone feel they're doing something to help so um <clears throat> so I hope you won't think that we're just being sort of uh, negative and vague Ben 
Um, but as ever, we're here to answer all your questions. And um, I hope you all know this already, but you can contact us at any time on press at extinctionrebellion.uk. And our press phone number, in case you don't have it, is 077-561-3636. Um, we're uh, looking forward to seeing you all on the ground. Thank you, all you panellists, for being such a wonderful group of people. And um, I'll see you all on the streets as well. Um, and so we'll, we'll close there and um, hopefully see you all soon.